We thought we'd come by to see how the new soccer stadium is coming along. It's hard to see, but it is progressing. Construction's taking place on what had been the ramps to and from Highway 40, just west of Union Station. When it's done, it will look like this, the new home of St. Louis's new Major League Soccer team, ready for its opening season in 2022. But we really didn't come to talk about a couple of years into our soccer future, but 70 years in our soccer past. Patrick Murphy tells the story about St. Louis's role in what is one of the biggest upsets anywhere, anytime in the world of sports. And it happened on June 29th, 1950. If the better team has an off day, if the lesser team has its best possible day, if some combination of skill and luck and happenstance all comes together, could it possibly happen? And every now and then it does. Such was the case in the summer of 1950, when teams from 13 nations traveled to Brazil to compete for the Soccer World Cup. Many of their countries had been devastated by World War II. It was a time to rebuild and return to normalcy. It had been 12 years since the last World Cup, the 1942 and 46 games having been canceled because of the war. The favorites were Uruguay, Spain, Brazil, and England. The American team that made the 30-hour plane trip was a ragtag bunch. Weekend players for the most part, they had to take time off from their day jobs to compete for their country. Six of the starters were from the East Coast, Philadelphia, Fall River, Massachusetts, and New York. The other five came from St. Louis, four from the same Italian neighborhood known as The Hill. It was the job of the U.S. Soccer Federation to put a national team together, and its president, Walter Giesler, was a St. Louisan who considered his hometown a soccer hotbed. The St. Louisans all knew each other and had played together for years in neighborhood and amateur games. Harry Keogh was a mailman, an Irish kid who learned soccer in the Spanish neighborhood he grew up in. Charlie Colombo, nicknamed Gloves because of his habit of playing in leather gloves, was a meat packer known for taking no prisoners on the field. Gino Pariani, a sheet metal stacker at a St. Louis can factory, married just three days before he left for Brazil. Two of the St. Louis players had seen action in Europe. Frank Pee Wee Wallace spent 16 months in a German POW camp after his tank was set afire at Anzio. Goalie Frank Borgi was decorated for his actions as a field medic in Normandy and made his living driving a hearse. They were tough, they were good, and they knew it. But the challenge before them was daunting. They lost their first game against Spain in the tourney, three to one. Next, they faced powerhouse England, and they had few illusions about the outcome. If we gave them a good hard game and give them, made them really work hard to win, that would have satisfied, you know, me personally. I was hoping to hold them down to four or five goals. And the chances of us winning in the United States was kind of uh, weak, you know. England was favored to win the whole thing that year, the World Cup. They were considered at that time the father of soccer. The British had good reason to be confident. London bookmakers put the odds of an American victory at 500 to one. U.S. Captain Walter Barr was from Philly where he played soccer part-time and taught physical education at a junior high school. He knew that whatever his team had going for it, it wasn't Polish. And there was no question that we were not full-time professionals. Everybody worked, everybody played on the weekends. We never had professional training. You should never go on the field thinking there's no reason that we can't win this game. Something can happen, lightning, a flood, a bad call by the official. A good bounce for you, a bad bounce for them. From the beginning, the English owned the ball, playing their own style of cool and controlled stiff upper lip. But no matter how many shots they took, nothing got past American goalie Frank Borgi. They could have had three or four goals in the first 20 minutes. They didn't get them. They hit the woodwork. Frank made some good saves. Uh, they didn't get a good bounce. And then, 38 minutes into the game, a miracle occurred. An incredible exchange between Barr and teammate Joe Gachins. Yeah, the ball came to me and I collected it. 
about 30 yards out from the goal, pushed it ahead a little bit and took a legitimate shot. I hit it fairly well, hoping to score a goal. Joe Gachins was in a lot of traffic and he somehow got to the ball and got a deflection on it. Joe, kind of, Joe Gachins kind of dove out of a line of players. Dove out and the ball was coming and he lunged like that and the ball went in. It was just a one in a million, really. And at halftime it said, U.S. one, England zero. Photos of the goal itself are rare because most of the photographers stationed themselves at the American goal, assuming that's where the action would be. Well, we thought it was great, but we also thought to ourselves, ooh, I mean, this is, <laughs> now we woke them up. But the Americans' defense held strong. And then, with eight minutes left in the second half, human wrecking ball Charlie Colombo blatantly tackled an English player, a move that could have changed the tide. Charlie fouled the guy outside the penalty area, and he hit him pretty good, because Charlie was capable of doing that. And it was, a, it was an obvious foul. That could have been a penalty kick. They could have thrown Charlie out of the game. There were, and no substitutions at that time. So if Charlie was thrown out, you know, we're playing with 10 players, and without the key man in the back, Charlie, who was our, you know, tough guy in the middle back there. But uh, Charlie says that the Italian referee says, bono, bono, good play on Charlie's part. Charlie, if his mother was playing center forward against him, she'd be in trouble. Charlie knew how to, had great timing, knew how to hit the ball and the man almost simultaneously. You know, so if you were a referee or something like that, you'd say, you know, he hit the ball first, you know, he, it wasn't a foul. And when the final whistle blew, thousands of spectators poured onto the field, carrying Gachins and Borgie on their shoulders. I thought the roof had came in. When they ran down on the playing field, they, they ran at me. I didn't know what was going on. In fact, I, I was trying to find a place to hide. <laughs> it was the world's favorite story. Little guy with heart and luck beats big guy. I still think that's one of the great things about sports, that the best team doesn't always win. The best player doesn't always win. In a way, I'm kind of sorry that Something making me feel so good made the other guys feel so bad. You know, because I'm sure when the English went home, the guys, how the hell them Yanks ever beat you guys? You know, stuff like that. Flying back to London Airport after their unsuccessful visit to Rio, Britain's World Cup team has come home. It couldn't have been a very cheerful occasion for the footballers, however glad they were to be back. For the high hopes with which they'd set out had been well and truly shattered. Their failure, especially against America, is largely put down to poor shooting. Well, anyway, there it is, a big disappointment for all concerned. Neither England nor the U.S. went on to win the cup. That honor went to Uruguay. The Americans returned to their neighborhoods, their jobs, and their local soccer clubs. This is a good shot here, isn't it? Face down at this time. It wasn't until almost 50 years later that a book, The Game of Their Lives, brought their story to a new generation. Hollywood shot the screen version, dressing up St. Louis to look like the summer of 1950. Actors were cast in the roles of the local heroes who stood now on the sidelines. No longer young men, but still treasuring the memory of an afternoon in Brazil when they showed the world that Americans could indeed play the world's sport.